Good afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on your time zone. Welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, double standard at EU borders organized by the European Human Rights Monitor. I am Michela Pugliese. I am a researcher on migration and asylum at the European Monitor. Uh, I am joined today by two experts I'm very glad to present, each uh, with a different expertise related to migration and human rights, Professor Eba Goyed and the human rights activist Anna Alboth. We were supposed to have also um, the MP Tineke Strick, the member of the European Parliament, uh, working mainly on migration and asylum policies, um, as well as citizenship and the rule of law. But unfortunately, I was just informed that she won't be able to participate in our session due to some technical problems with her email box at the European Parliament. Uh, that's really a pity, but we hope to to meet her in the next occasion as she's always very uh, willing and eager to, to participate in events of this kind uh, related to human rights and, and migrants' human rights. So just a few communications before we begin. Uh, for all those uh, listening to us, uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of our discussion. So if you have any uh, comment or question you would like to, to make, um, to our speakers, please keep them in mind until the end of the, the presentations, and then you can uh, use the raise end function to uh, to get your turn uh, to speak. So um, I'd like to give just um, a short introduction on our on our title and on the topic we are discussing today. Um, in this webinar, we will discuss, as the title suggests, um, Europe's double standard towards asylum seekers. Um, as Europe's um, spread and the warm response to, to people fleeing Ukraine um, should be the role, but actually it is an exception, as people seeking international protection all over um, European internal and external borders are still rejected, are still armed, are still pushed back, and sometimes even die uh, due to these borders. Some migrants, differently from the, the Ukrainians, were legitimately uh, re received and welcomed. Some migrants are still unwanted. The clearest sign of this double standard can be found in the policies and practices developed at the European and national levels after the invasion of Ukraine. Um, the UN Commission promptly activated for, for the first time in its history the Temporary Protection Directive to grant uh, to the people fleeing in immediate protection. MP Streak could have provided us with more information on this, but this directive was adopted in 2001 and never applied before, even though there were other cases of mass influx of displaced uh, people fleeing similarly uh, war and persecution and violence from third countries. I'm thinking of, of Syrians, of Afghans, uh, of the same uh, refugees and asylum seekers who today are still trapped and in need of protection in Greece, in Turkey, along the Balkan route, or in the woods between uh, Poland and, and Belarus, a border that Anna both knows so well. So at the national level, um, to welcome legitimately the, the Ukrainian refugee wave, all neighbors uh, all neighboring countries have opened their borders and, and also states led by nationalist governments that have always been um, reluctant to, to, to welcome refugees like Poland and Hungary, for instance. Um, in the meanwhile, the same authorities discriminated and blocked on many occasions third country nationals from the Middle East and Africa, like students and workers living in Ukraine. And there are several reports of the Ukrainian police stopping African nationals from boarding buses and trains to, to flee the country and also uh, of um, Polish uh, border guards refusing them entry to Poland. Indeed, the, this legitimate rush to help Ukraine civilians makes the, the, such disregard for, for these other um, human tragedies um, that still occur today across the same European borders, particularly vivid and I would say particularly offensive. Um, because while European countries provide the Ukrainian refugees with official and safe transit routes, yesterday over 90 people have lost their lives in the Mediterranean after uh, the latest shipwreck and after departing from Libya on an overcrowded boat. And only four survived uh, thanks to a commercial tanker that rescued them, but they were immediately taken back uh, to, to Libya, and therefore to Libya detention centers. So we wanted to hold this webinar to remind that all asylum seekers are equal and that they should be equal also in the rights provided to them. Therefore, safe routes um, should be provided to all migrants and asylum seekers, regardless of the race, of their religion, of their nationality, of the war they are escaping from. And to develop this concept today, we will talk with um, Professor Eba Goyed, 
who is assistant professor of sociology at Boston University, um, researching particularly on low-income people's access to social services, immigration laws, and bureaucracies in de destination countries, and also on the gender and racial inequalities that they face in, in destination countries. Professor Goyed received a bachelor from the American University in Cairo in political science and her PhD from Princeton University in sociology. Um, she wrote a book, Refuge, that explores how states shape the potential of people seeking protection within their borders, and she is currently working on her second book, The Cost of Borders, which theorizes borders as a costly and often deadly transaction, as we know well in Europe, I'd say. So uh, I will turn off my microphone and the floor is yours, Professor Goyet. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody who has logged on to listen today. Um, can somebody just give me an indication that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so today I've been asked to speak on the issue of displacement, um, human displacement, and on the double standards. Um, and I want to begin by saying that the displacement of Ukrainians, like any other human crisis of displacement, is a terrible tragedy. We know that the human toll of war is absolutely horrific, um, that even those who do return to their countries uh, or who find legal status elsewhere are condemned to more ma family members who will not return. And as we see with Syrians, Afghanis, Palestinians, Iraqis, um, war and persecution condemn families and nations to endless diasporas, to be haunted even in joyful moments by guilt for loved ones who have suffered and who continue to suffer. And we know that the longer that war continues, any war, um, the more people will be forced out of their homes and into a global patchwork of national systems that are designed to protect the displaced. Um, borders, in fact, that are designed to exclude those who need resources and stability from countries that have it. And the thing is, though, um, while everyone is subject to persecution, uh, everyone who is subject to persecution suffers dire, these unfathomable human costs, the systems that they attempt to find respite in do not treat them all the same. And here, surprising no one who pays attention, um, race matters, race and racism as inequalities. It matters in shaping, in, in, uh, in seeing who is seen as a human being or who is lumped into a refugee crisis, a horde, a wave, or a scourge. It determines whose lives are valued, who is recognized as someone who is worthy of state support and of refuge and who isn't. And the fact is that since it is white refugees who are fleeing Ukraine or predominantly white refugees, the world is paying closer attention right now altogether to issues of displacement. And more people are noticing, too, the racism that's happening at the borders. Many, myself included, are calling out the ostentatious racism of the discreetment at the border um, that we're seeing between Ukrainians and people from other backgrounds who are predominantly black and brown. How, for instance, here in the United States, Title 42, a public health ordinance, um, which has been used to deny people from seeking asylum at the southern border, uh, was lifted by the Biden administration when they directed uh, Border Patrol to use their discretion when it came for Ukrainians and not for anyone else. Um, or how in Europe, Poland is building a 350 million euro wall to keep black and brown refugees out while welcoming Ukrainians in. Um, how there were reports of two lines of people fleeing Ukraine, right? One white and one non-white. But what I want to, uh, you know, talk about today, or what I want to argue today, is that the focus on this more loud, more ostentatious racism distracts from the more quiet, more pernicious, more mystical racism that's been going on well before the crisis began in Ukraine and will continue to go on long after. Uh, our systems of refuge are structured, whether it be in the United States or in Europe, to dehumanize people, and especially people um, who, are, who tend to be black and brown, um, who are the majority of the world's refugees. And to understand this is to understand two things. First is to understand that the epicenter of the world's displacement crisis today is not Europe or the United States, but it's places like the Mexican-Guatemala border uh, and countries like Turkey, Jordan, or Lebanon who have their own infrastructural challenges to overcome. So as many of you already know, uh, the number of people displaced globally right now far exceeds the numbers of people displaced after World War II. Um, this is literally the worst it's ever been, and the situation is getting even more dire. So today, over 84 million people, one in every 95, is displaced outside of their homes. And these numbers don't even account for people dis dis uh, displaced from the Ukraine, from Ukraine, sorry. Um, approximately half are in their country of origin. Take the case of Syria, for example, which is what I write about in my book. Um, Syria today remains the largest contributing country to this displacement crisis. And five out of the 11 million displaced uh, people in Syria remain within Syria. The vast majority of the rest, 83% um, of all Syrian refugees, are in these proximate countries. For instance, Lebanon, a country with 6 million refugees, has one, uh, 6 million people, has 1 million Syrian refugees. So what does this look like? It looks like people crowded in camps at the border with Turkey and Syria in places like Gaziantep. It looks like students with interrupted formal education. Only 34% of refugee kids globally are enrolled in school, which means the vast majority are not. 
Um, and part of the reason why these numbers, for instance, of educational enrollment are so low is that there's very little assistance offered to these countries in handling the challenge of supporting displaced people globally. And this brings me to my second point, which is that the world has effectively shut its coffers and its doors to supporting displaced people. And what we're seeing in the case of the predominantly white, predominantly Christian Ukrainian refugees is an exception to the rule. Students of history know that inequalities we observe today, the way our borders are set out, is patterned by colonial pasts, as well as presence of foreign economic and military intervention, and also the present environmental crisis that we're dealing with. You cannot understand the war in Syria, for instance, without understanding French colonialism. You cannot understand it without understanding American imperialism either, that ISIS was born in Camp Buka, a US-run prison in Iraq. You cannot understand the US-Mexico border unless you understand the border of indigenous people, that the border, as Mexican-Americans say, um, is one that they did not cross, but that crossed them. As a result, these border zones become, as Gloria Anzaldua put it, a place where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. Refugees are knocking on the doors of the very same countries whose foreign policies have subjugated either them or people like them, and whose domestic policies are patterned by the same racisms that facilitated those foreign policies. And in the name of state sovereignty, these coveted destinations have made their borders impermeable. So this is true here in the United States. Recently, the Biden administration, for instance, committed to welcoming 100,000 Ukrainians through a mix of humanitarian parole and resettlement. Simultaneously, the administration has neglected to rebuild the country's resettlement system. So though our resettlement quota for this year, for instance, is 125,000 people, we're currently falling dramatically short of this number. That's because our resettlement system has been decimated, first by the Trump administration, which used Islamophobic rhetoric and called Syrian children Trojan horses for terrorism, and then because the Biden administration has neglected to rebuild it, which um, is not a question of capacity, right? We spend billions it would be, um, and, you know, in the, in the tens of billions uh, on border security, but for some reason we don't have the money to, to rebuild our systems of asylum and resettlement. And again, this leaves millions of people in the lurch in the conditions I've just described to you. This is also true in Europe. Um, I spent the last semester in Greece where I saw this for myself. Well, of course, in 2015, a million people took boats across the Aegean and due to the sheer multitude were able to make it to countries in Europe. Since then, these countries have closed their doors to new arrivals. Today, anyone attempting to journey to Greece, for instance, from Izmir on a blow-up raft or through the land at Evros, experiences incredible amounts of violence. These are termed pushbacks, where authorities in the water, Greek authorities with the help of Frontex, break people's engine and, against international law regulations, pull them back into Turkish waters and into the hands of the Turkish Coast Guard, which, as part of the externalization of, of EU borders, is tasked with keeping them there. But even when you do make it, the process is marked by one of violence, by the bleeding described by Anzaldua. That's because the process of bordering, whether characterized by physical walls or digital surveillance, as my friend Petra Molnar shows in her work, is one of brutality. I'd like to share with you a story, one story from my fieldwork that illustrates this. So um, the time that I spent in Greece was in Athens and also on the islands of Lesbos and Samos. And I spoke to people who had successfully made the journey, um, including Trians, Somalis, Palestinians, Afghanis, and Syrian. And one Syrian man I spoke to described the ways that refugees manage their travel. And in this description, you can see the violence of borders and their costs illuminated um, for the travelers who make these journeys every day. Um, he told me that he left his smuggler's payment, which was around 2,000 euros, in a broker's office, who held it on his behalf because the pushbacks had gotten so frequent and so commonplace that migrants do not want to pay smugglers before making sure that the smuggler is successful in getting them to where they're going. At the, borders pla at the, at the broker's place, there's also a DHL office, and they leave with him things like passports, cherished photos, but also cell phones, because they're fearful that they can be tracked by the signal of their phone. So this man, for instance, described sewing phone numbers that he'd need upon arrival into the lapel of his T-shirt. He told me they have all this technology, but we have this, as he said, he pulled on his T-shirt tag. He and, uh, and the two women companions uh, would try eight times to cross the border at Evros before making it on their night. Each time they were beaten and stripped of their belongings, left only in their T-shirts and pants. The women reported sexual harassment, fondling at the hands of border guards under the auspices of searching their breasts for contraband. Indeed, I did not speak to a single woman in Greece who had made the journey, who had not experienced sexual violence of some sort, either from authorities or from fellow travelers. And I did my interview with this man um, and one of the women he traveled with in an ISO box, a shipping container in a camp they'd been living in for two years in Greece. And that's because the Greek authorities are very slow to hear asylum claims, and upon hearing them from Syrians, reject them outright, claiming that Turkey is a safe third condom due to their Muslim heritage, right? A racist and untrue claim. And this policy of rejection means that after they arrive in Greece, after they arrive at the European Union, refugees often live lives of destitution. There are reports that say that refugee children in Greek camps also do not get um, an education. 
And on the Aegean islands, we're seeing the building of EU-funded closed controlled access centers, which are prison-like camps, which refugees can only leave with prior approval and only for a few days a week. They cannot go out on Sundays because the Greeks, as I was told, quote, deserve a day for themselves. Contrasting the lives of refugees in this camp to the case of the 4 million Ukrainians offered three-year residencies under the Temporary Protection Directive um, and the right to work is jarring, of course. But the reception of Ukrainians is truly the exception to a system that has long and as a matter of logistical and default practice denied the humanity of those who fled their country to get to Europe or the United States. Systematically, then, even when they're offered legal protection, refugees from the Middle East or from elsewhere in the world are not made to feel welcome. Their potential as human beings, their skills and abilities, their hopes and aspirations for themselves and their children often unheard and unmet. Indeed, even when people arrive in the United States or in Canada or in Germany, the three countries where I did research for my book Refuge, they still have to contend with systems that see them as outsiders. And these are the same systems Ukrainians will enter too, though we don't know how they'll be did uh, with that entry. Here, for instance, in the U.S., Syrians who settled in 2015 were the targets of inflammatory rhetoric and travel bans. They are subject to welfare policies, the same policies, mind you, that black and brown uh, people here have long endured, that barely support them and expect them to become self-sufficient or non-reliant on government assist shortly after their arrival. In Germany, uh, too, uh, Syrians who arrived there reported that their credentials are denied as they enter a German system designed for Germans. But for the Syrians, and which is something that Ukrainians are going to have to manage too, right, the German system of credentialization. But for Syrians in my book, they also had to contend with the fact that they were told they did not fit into German notions of leading culture, that in order to assimilate, in order to fit in, they would have to relinquish parts of their identity. So to conclude, to me, the reaction to Ukrainian refugees show, shows me what's possible when we believe that people fleeing are centrally and primarily human beings like us. It shows that the permeability of our borders is less to do with state sovereignty and more to do with political will. We decide every day who we keep out based on notions of who we determine to belong, who fits into our imagination of what our countries are. So the discrepant treatment at the border, whether in Europe or whether in the United States, the double standard that motivates this, this uh, panel today is instructive in that it is revelatory. It invites us to imagine a world where we recognize people seeking refuge, not as security threats or burdens, but as complex human beings with untold potential just like us. And with that, um, I will, Hand the, hand the mic back and I look forward to hearing um, Anna's remarks and all of your questions. Thank you very, very much for your powerful uh, presentation and your really meticulous uh, remarks. I absolutely agree with you uh, that the, the permeability of European borders depend on the political will. This is clear with the Ukrainian refugee crisis. States were so eager to open their borders, so it's possible to do that. It's possible to receive and to welcome a mass influx of displaced people, no matter way, where they come from. This should be uh, the rule. I absolutely agree uh, with you also that, that um, a more subtle and, and a more quiet and, and a kind of logistical racism, for instance, in migration management and asylum system existed in Europe long before this crisis. As you said, it's visible and in, a, in the destitution of the within the refugee camps or in the attempts made by asylum seekers to reach Europe, even risking um, their, their their skin and and their lives. Um, and yeah, it, it was very very um, powerful. And uh, I also agree that race matters and, and it still determines whose lives are valued across these borders and whose um, very humanity is, is still denied um, in, in Europe in 2022. So now, I will now pass uh, the microphone to Ms. Uh, Anna Alboth, who is a Polish journalist, a blogger, and human rights activist. She gained international attention as the initiator of the Civil March for Aleppo, a nine-month awareness-raising peace march on foot from Berlin to Syria from December 2016 to August 2017, walking in the opposite direction to Syrian refugees forced to flee their homes and seek asylum in Europe. For such an extraordinary example of grassroots activism, Ms. Alboth was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018. Now she's working as media programs coordinator for the human rights organization Minority Rights Group with a special focus on Europe and particularly on Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria and Slovakia. But uh, last summer she and other activists also initiated a group called Grupa Granica, I hope to, to say it correctly, a group of Polish human rights organizations supporting, giving visibility, taking care of people trapped exactly at borders uh, between the Belarusian and Polish border and unable to formalize their asylum request, to claim asylum, to receive protection. So 
you have the floor now, Ms. Albu. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, well, I have a feeling that so much, most important things were already said by my previous colleague, uh, that the only thing I can imagine doing now is to, is to give you some of the examples from the ground, from both of the borders, uh, Ukrainian and Belarusian border, where I spent uh, the last months on. Um, it's, um, it, I, I must say that it's a very difficult situation what happened in the last uh, month for the activists on the ground, especially those who were active on the Belarusian border uh, since August. Uh, and I will, I will get into details why is it so difficult. As a, as a Polish person, I'm, I'm Polish, I, I live in Germany together with family and I work on the topic of migration on very different European borders. But still, Poland, seeing the last month of um, amazing support for Ukrainian, Ukrainians leaving Ukraine, um, I should be very happy, right? I should say that, uh, finally Poland can show this face of hospitality, open arms. Um, but when I went during the first days of the invasion, this time invasion of uh, Russia to, to Ukraine, and I saw the crowds of people on the border, um, I had this one moment when I really broke down and I would, what was it? It was uh, on the most north crossing between Ukraine and Poland, very close to the border. And uh, there was the, the car of the border guards in the uniform standing, like on every border. Um, in this car, there was little Ukrainian boy and the border guards together with policemen were comforting him, playing with him, uh, throwing some balloon and using heavy bear. You know, everybody was smiling. There was another policeman coming with some food. There were hundreds of Polish people around offering transportation and accommodation in different corners of Poland. Uh, ideal situation that I would imagine happening on every border, uh, welcoming people in need. So this boy, and I just couldn't stop thinking about uh, the last months that I spent since August on, on the Belarusian border, where people in the same suits, in the same uniforms, uh, instead of taking care of little boys on the border, uh, were violent pushing them, screaming at them, threatening them, uh, and bringing them back to the to the fence with Belarus and brutally pushing them through it. I was witnessing those kind of situations many times. Um, as Michaela, as you said, uh, together with uh, 14 different organizations uh, on migration in Poland, we started a collective, Anita, uh, that decided in the middle of August to, to act when the editor of um, Belarus, Lukashenko, brought um, refugees from all over, from very different directions, mainly from the Middle East, but not only, to the territory of Belarus. It's, uh, it's a very well organized new migration path to Europe um, and started to bring them to the, to the Lithuanian and Polish border to push them through. Together with all these activists, we decided that uh, Polish, uh, Polish East, East of Poland, will need support. That's the place. It's a very remote place where People were never touching the topic of migration. And first we saw each other a bit as, a, as an educational tool. We had the feeling that it is normal that some old Polish lady living on the village might get scared if uh, a random black guy will knock on her doors at night and ask for a bottle of water. It's normal. People are afraid of, of, of differences, of situations that they don't know. So we thought that we can, we can answer those fears, we can answer those doubts. Uh, and we started a, a educational campaign. Um, we started some info number where locals could call us to ask questions. Our teams were going from doors to doors along the Belarusian border to give people information, not to teach, not to, you know, not to be smart, but rather answer questions and doubts. Uh, but Polish government uh, very fastly in, introduced measures that we didn't expect. One of them was um, legalizing pushbacks, so something that is of course happening on different European borders, on the Croatian-Bosnian border, on the Turkish-Greek border, on the Spanish-Moroccan border. Uh, but for for a long time, it was not that obvious that it's happening, and it's still not not that uh, those countries are very proud of it. Uh, different than that, Polish government uh, announced it very fast, and since that time is uh, showing off every day on Twitter, saying how many people they managed to push back. 
but the second and probably even worse thing that they introduced was to introduce so-called um, state of emergency along the whole border with Belarus, a three to five kilometers line uh, where nobody could enter. Only people living there, only local people could be there and nobody else, uh, no humanitarian organizations, no media, nobody since the 2nd of September until now, and uh, the state is still prolonged, is able to visit this place. What it means in practice is that uh, hundreds and thousands of people that were trying to cross from the Belarusian side uh, and were used as a, as a ping pong ball between Belarusian authorities and Polish authorities were stuck there, are stuck there, it, there is still a few hundred people right now there, without any help. Um, they would freeze to death, they would die of hunger, uh, they would have nothing to drink, they would have diseases, obviously immune system was going down lower and lower during those months. We had very cold winter, um, leaving people there and introducing the state of em emergency is nothing else than policy of letting people die. Maybe it's not an active killing, but it's letting people die being absolutely aware that people have no chances to survive in this kind of circumstances. So seeing this boy on the Ukrainian border and this friendly border guard playing with him, I just, I just started to cry. I couldn't stop myself. I went to this border guard and I asked him if, he, if he's also that friendly 50 kilometers north on the Belarusian border when he meets refugee kids. And you know what? He looked at me very seriously and he answered something that made me think even more. He said, thanks God, nobody sent me to that border. And you know, seeing the answer of Polish society in the situation when they were allowed to act human, where they were allowed to drive their own cars to the border, uh, to welcome people, to invite them to their cars, not being detained immediately as smugglers, inviting them home. Thousands, thousands of people invited refugees home. Uh, made me think that when what is happening on the Belarusian border, where we are not allowed to act, when we have to run in the forest at night with big backpacks full of food, hiding from Polish authorities and from drones flying around us, to be able to bring absolutely basic help, water and something to eat is just insane. And of course, it's not an accident that those two measures were taken in a very way that Ukraine, we opened the borders, people even without passports were allowed to cross. And uh, on the Belarusian border, we would use the narration of uh, um, the, the anti, 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 um, anti-migration narration. Um, what Polish government, but not only Polish government, in general Europe is doing, they are also playing very much with definitions, right? We know that it's easier to uh, treat some people better and some worse if we have some um, definition, explanation to that. Yes, we put some people as a, um, as a proper refugees. This is how, how Polish government now is saying. And those who are again, quotation, a weapon of Lukashenko in, in hybrid war. So in one uh, situation, we are absolutely dehumanizing people. And in another, we are bringing back all this uh, good feelings about brotherhood of uh, Polish and Ukrainians and all of these things that put us closer together. Um, what I still wanted to say is that those few other tricks that um, Polish government and also European country are using, which we all know probably, uh, all the people listening here probably know all of them, but it's always good to, uh, to think about it, how, how it is being used, not to be tricked, but also to have answers to this. In Poland now, the, the view of a proper refugee who deserves our care and attention uh, is a woman, is an innocent poor woman with a kid on her hand. Yes, this is exactly the, the stereotype that we have in our heads, that those people need our support. And this is what Ukrainian situation is absolutely saying because uh, of the military uh, obligation, men between 18 and 60 are not let out of Ukraine. So Polish-Ukrainian border is, is in fact full of women with kids.
um, I have never seen anything like this on any other European border. But I also understand politics and geopolitics, and I understand that you cannot compare what is happening in Ukraine to what is happening in Afghanistan, Yemen, or Syria, and that average European person might not know or not want to know all the connections and interactions between all of this. Um, so it is easier to Polish people to take care of a woman with a kid than by the, uh, to take care of, of men. Uh, another argument uh, which Polish right-wing love to bring up is that men should be fighting on the war, right? That proper refugee uh, is, 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 not, is not a person like we are seeing on the, on the Belarusian border, which is, again, I mean, I don't have to repeat it, uh, how radicalous it is. Um, but what is, what is still very interesting is the argument of crossing green border and coming to the border crossings. This is highly used right now. Uh, in the public sphere. From the very interesting fact, I can tell you that uh, on the Polish-Ukrainian border, there was already 1,700 men stopped, men who wanted to leave the country, but they couldn't. There is also a lot of people who, of course, were not stopped, and about those we don't really know. But it's interesting to see that Polish border guards, when they meet on the green border Ukrainian men, they let them apply for international protection which is a huge difference from what is happening with men, women, disabled kids, tiny babies on the Belarusian border. Um, yes, wait one second. What did I want to say afterwards? So when we have all these all this, uh, language games, when we have the situation that there is a zone where media cannot enter, I can tell you it's probably the only place in European Union where journalists cannot do their work. Uh, and this is also done not by access. Uh, why we don't want to see um, the faces of victims on the Belarusian border? Uh, why we are letting them die you know, at night somewhere behind the curtain of the forest where nobody can enter? Because it's easier to live without bad conscience if we're seeing it. This is what media are able to do. They can humanize the conflict. Yes, they can give the human face to situations. And this is what is happening on all the news channels about Ukraine. We see the sad faces of women there, uh, but we are not able to see faces of people on Belarusian border. I think that introducing this uh, zone of emergence was was cruelly brilliant move to do exactly this, to take away those pictures that would touch us and that would make us act. Uh, one border is closed, fenced, uh, guarded by police and army, and the second is open, smiling, full of people willing to help. And of course, there is less people involved on the Belarusian border because we are risking being detained, we are risking being arrested, we are risking uh, our physical and mental health go at night to the swamped forest where nobody knows what will happen. Um, when people are allowed to help, when it's fully appreciated by the society, and not criminalized, everything is easier. And I think this situation is showing this, this, this double standard in, in treating those trend borders where on both borders we have people running away from Putin's bomb. Yes, sometimes Ukrainians, sometimes Syrians. This is just crazy to see. And I, even if I'm, if I'm terrified since a month to see uh, this amount of racism and double standards, I have tiny hope that this could be the beginning of new discussions, that maybe what we knew in Europe for the last 15 years, the migration policies and rules, maybe it's a moment to shake it a little bit. And I see our role in pointing all these failures and showing how ridiculous some of these behaviors are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your heartfelt contribution, your precious testimony from the field. And really thank you for, for the work you're carrying out um, with Grupa Granica, Grupa Granica, I say. Um, it must be very, very tough to, to support the basic needs. I'm talking food, water, blankets against the freezing temperatures of people who risk not to survive due to states policies. And all of these between a state of emergency, the desire to do more and more in order to be helpful and possibly the thought that it will never be enough. And also the criminalization of your uh, work, both as a, as a journalist and as a humanitarian uh, actor. Um, 
and and as it happens all over Europe to, to civilians and activists trying to help migrants both at land or at sea. Uh, we have seen it with the criminalization of, of the humanitarian boats uh, all over the Mediterranean. Um, the same thing, it happens to people who see migrants and treat migrants as humans, also a simple civilians. It has occurred so many times also in Italy as well. Um, I also agree on the gendered dimension you've mentioned. Uh, it seems that for authorities, it's easier to welcome and accept women and children who are the main um, refugees fleeing Ukraine due to, to the martial law uh, imposed there, due to, of course, stereotyped prejudice and, and twisted, um, distorted and, and, and really bad ideas, as if they were, um, I will use your words there, um, give the human face uh, to, to this type of refugees while denying the same human face on other um, refugees, on other situations. Um, I also understand the double feeling towards this refugee wave, the, the, the hope, the relief, the, the satisfaction also uh, felt as Europeans, as human beings, uh, provided by such responsiveness towards the Ukrainian people, uh, also in light of, of the terrible images of, of Bucha uh, that were um, reported and um, these uh, yesterday. Though it also entails a bitter consideration because it proves that, uh, as we were saying before, also with the Professor Goyev, um, that the borders depend on the political will that the European Union holds the to open them and to set up exceptional measures as the temporary protection directives we were mentioned at the beginning to offer immediate protection to people, the willingness also to cooperate among member states when they want to. And also the consciousness that uh, mobility is natural, especially in case of violence, and especially um, when the majority of asylum seekers tend to go to their neighboring countries, as we were, you were saying um, also, Professor Goyed. So we have, we have them in Lebanon, we have them in Jordan, we have them in Turkey, but also all around um, in Uganda, for instance, in the neighboring um, countries, close to home, let's say. So, yeah, it, uh, it seems that Europe won't learn the lesson uh, that refugees must not be feared and, uh, and they must not be felt as weapons or as threats in the ends of re regimes and dictators like Lukashenko and as you were saying in Salbov. So now I would like to, um, to allow uh, the audience, so all those who are listening to us, to, um, if, if someone has questions or comments uh, to maybe question to specific speakers or to the whole panel, you can use, um, I think there is a raise hand function here in uh, the Twitter spaces, and I can let you speak. Let's see if somebody has something to say. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I have a question. <laughs> I have a question um, that, I pose also to myself, I have a question for both of you, I would say, uh, in the meanwhile. Um, so do you think that these um, legitimate, also beautiful, in a sense, rush of solidarity all over Europe, both from governments and civil society organizations, from, from civilians, will eventually allow European societies to um, better realize actually what a war means and what and therefore be less scared, more open to the idea of welcoming refugees, maybe even more eager to um, advocate and call for better laws managing migration, both from their governments, and I'm talking to, to the people, to civil society actors, or also at the European level, and there I'm talking about um, EU member states. Do you think this, this is possible, or it's like a utopia? Um, Maybe I'll maybe I'll start, um, and then Anna. Um, I'm sure you have you have thoughts on this since you're on the ground in in, in Europe right now. Um, from my perspective, my answer would be no. Um, I don't think that the lack of will to help people to help people who are displaced ever had to do with the lack of knowledge of what war is or a lack of knowledge of what displacement is. Um, I think it's a lack of willingness to help that's based in sort of dehumanization of people, and we saw that in the reaction to Ukrainian displacement in media coverage, in policy coverage, right? People saying, well, these are refugees, blue eyes and blonde hair, like us. Um, these are people who look us. These are families, like our families. Um, these, it's not like the wars in Iraq or Syria or any of these places. This isn't the Middle East, right? Um, so we saw all of that boundary drawing. Um, but also, I don't know that this kind of goodwill will persist, right? So we have an example, for instance, in the 1990s 
with the displacement, for instance, of Croatians, including in Germany. And we there was a, a you know a repatriation. Right, people were sent back. Um, the the political will didn't persist because um, you know politicians used it eventually to sort of draw a line um, and marginalize the group that was displaced that are in the end um, strangers. Right, and we know that there's actually a lot of discrimination against Eastern Europeans um, in Western European contexts. So. Uh, so, you know, maybe I'm a pessimist, um, but no, I don't think that uh, that we're going to see a huge um, shift. And I wonder, I, I'm, I'm eager to hear what Anna thinks. Well, I, <laughs> I'm trying to be realistic. And if I'm realistic, then I guess I'm closer to you. But I want to have this hope. And I will explain you why I, 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 I have still a little bit of hope that it can change something into better. First of all, we, like we are here talking we know that some of the solutions depend only on the will or lack of will. Yes, it's clear for us, but I think it's not clear for, for wider society. I think when politicians are using those arguments like we don't have space or mm, it's difficult to integrate new people, uh, now black and white we see, well, Poland has space. Yes, in 2015, Poland didn't want to take 7,000 Syrians from Greece in the relocation program because we didn't have space. And suddenly we have 2 million spaces and it's possible. And I think that this is something that cannot be unseen, that things like this were possible. Uh, so I hope that it gives us a bit of this argument to, to face the Hippocratic standards sometimes. And I also think that we could all learn some of the good Solution. So, for example, what we are seeing now with Ukrainians coming to Poland, but then also going to different countries. This is, again, the argument that people like to use, that real refugees should stay in the country closest to where they come from, right? Why, they, why Syrians come to Europe if they can stay in Lebanon or in Turkey? And suddenly, uh, Ukrainians coming, for example, 20 through Poland, nobody calls them not real refugees. Suddenly, it is clear for Europe that... Um, that refugees might be moving somewhere else because of different reasons, because they already have family or because there is already job waiting for them. So this, this choice of movement that we would wish to see for everybody um, is, is being practiced right now a little bit. Maybe, 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 maybe we will be able to use those arguments in the future uh, and, to, and, and to, as I said, to point out all those differences and, uh, and, and use them against the politicians who would like maybe to have solutions only for some kind of refugees. We are there as civil society to not to let them divide them all the time. Okay, thank you very much, both of you, for your answers. Yeah, I think I agree with you both. I agree that states and governments are reluctant to give up to their appropriate standards it's clear that they're using the Ukrainian refugee wave also to further marginalize and discriminate black and brown asylum seekers. We have seen it um, on these very weeks. We have seen it yesterday and these days when um, in France, um, several young um, migrants coming from Guinea, Mali, Afghanistan were evacuated from their shelters, uh, ruled by the prefecture in different uh, French cities to make way for incoming Ukrainian refugees. But also personally, um, I've been working in Roma and Roma in Italy with, with uh, asylum seekers. And uh, at the police office at the Questura, where they have to formalize their asylum claims, they have said um, that they have been starting to create two different queues, physical, physical queues, one for the Ukrainians and one for all the other nationalities. And so often the other nationalities are sent back home without the possibility of to um, formalize their asylum claim. A guy told me he tried to, um, to, to formalize his claim at the, in the police office eight times. And each time he was sent back due to several justifications like the lack of uh, personnel or the lack of papers while Ukrainians are given priority to, let's say. This is really, uh, I, this, uh, abhorrent, I would say, because they are all vulnerable refugees. There is no class A and class B uh, protection or need to protection, but still uh, governments are, are using this very, this very humanitarian crisis to do that, to marginalize even more uh, the already vulnerable ones. So I've seen that there are no, no questions or comments. <laughs> so 
I have another one actually, and then I think we can also wrap that up um, if you want to. Um, I've, we have seen that several European politicians. Uh, in Greece, in Italy, in, in Bulgaria, uh, invited their governments to, to welcome the Ukraine citizens fleeing the conflict, referring to them as the real refugees, escaping the real wars. Um, why do you think that, um, as we were saying, the Syrians, the Palestinians, the Afghans, the Iraqis, the, the Libyans, uh, are so often described as, as dangerous or as fake or as threats, weapons, even terrorists in your opinion? Is it for really for um, for mere racism? Is it the color of their skin, their religion, the nationality, or, or their low class, or their, their assumed low class, uh, even uh, like in the, the stereotyped vision of the, uh, the, the refugee in, the, in, their, in their minds, I would say. And I answered the last one first. Do you want to go first on this one, or do you want me to start? You can start, no problem. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I don't think class uh, explains this. Um, I don't think class explains this at all. Um, we know, for instance, that uh, in the Syrian diaspora, um, there are doctors and lawyers and, um, you know, people who had um, great positions. We know that they're skilled artisans. Um, we know that they're highly educated people. We also know that there are, you know, people who, who, um, who are not highly educated, right? Um, and the thing is, is that we're not asking these questions, what the class background are of the people who are displaced when we look at uh, Ukrainians who are displaced, right? We only ask these questions of how they'll benefit us or how the people who are arriving here will benefit us um, when we look at people who we don't humanize because we're humanizing ourselves, right? We're centering ourselves and we're asking where the benefit to us is. Um, and so race really is the determining factor, right? And, and this is nothing new. I mean, this is the same logic that perpetuated colonialism for centuries. It's the same logic that perpetuates imperialism. It's even the same logic when we think about the climate crisis uh, and the ramifications of the crisis, right? Um, who cares that people are drowning in Bangladesh, right? Um, who cares that, you know, that there's droughts in Syria, which are also a mitigating factor for this war. And so when we think about it, race and, and, and dehumanization really is at the core of this. Um, and it cannot be explained by class. It cannot be explained. You know, a journalist once asked me, can we explain it by proximity? Well, you know, uh, Poland and Ukraine are close to each other, and therefore uh, people from Poland are more likely to welcome people from Ukraine. Well, how do you expect? How do you explain Greece and Turkey? Greece, the Aegean Islands, um, are are you know you can see Turkey from there, from from the land. Proximity does not mean uh, affinity, right? Uh, and so we have to think about this as really um, you know centered on the axis of race that shapes who is seen as a human being, who is seen as a complex person with aspirations, um, you know, dreams, um, abilities, also. Um, and who is just seen flattened into terrorism, into a potential threat, into something to be scrutinized, into someone to be uh, vetted. Um, and we see this too, for instance, in how the Biden administration is trying to track Ukrainians through the American resettlement system, which is notorious in its very, very long two-year delays due to the perception of refugees as dangerous. Well, for some reason, these refugees are not dangerous, right, in the very same systems. And no, class, I don't think, uh, can explain it. Yeah, I, I, I love everything what you said. I will still add to this uh, education and diversity and history. Um, this is I can I can tell you from the very locally from the Polish perspective on the Polish example. Um, there is, and there was no education on anything else than Europe in Poland. Yes, uh, Polish students, Polish adults. Uh, they have no idea about books or cinema or theater uh, from outside of Europe, and of course, this is the this is the uh, racist uh, attitude that that you are mentioning. But I, I I mean in practice, I live daily in Berlin. I have two kids. I know what they are learning in school, and I see how how big difference it makes from the very beginning on. Those people on the east of Poland who've never seen. Uh, as an example, a black person, yes? They also haven't seen a black person in Polish TV. Uh, and what they know about people from far away are very basic stereotypes, stupid films with dividing people between good and bad. Um, and this needs a lot of attention, but this needs the, uh, the wheel, the political wheel to, for example, let NGOs run workshops in primary schools, which since 
five years in Poland, NGOs are not allowed to do any activities with kids because government wants to have it under control. Uh, so there's very little examples uh, to a basic uh, idea of uh, Europe putting itself in the middle as always. Um, there is just so much work to be done in this topic. <laughs> Yes, thank you. I agree again. Um, yeah, on the contrary, on the contrary, many of the asylum seekers and refugees I've met also here in Italy are even overqualified compared to the jobs they find, or they have higher university degrees and titles that often they are not even able to convert. And I think this is another reflection of the, the that uh, quite and logistical racism uh, we were talking about at the beginning. So I think that there was a participant who wanted to um, ask a question, Oscar. I think you can um, switch on your, your mic and, and speak. Or maybe not, Oscar. <laughs> they told me that you can um, be able to use your microphone on your own or ask maybe uh, to switch it on and I can, uh, okay, <laughs> okay, great. You can speak. Now. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. So it's just that I'm learning so much. So I, I rather listen to you guys a bit more. Yeah, um, that's very interesting, very interesting um, discussion. Thanks for having me here. Ah, thank you so much. <laughs> we are very happy about questions. <laughs> I think there are none. Mm, let me see. Even comments, or I don't know, if you want to share your view, if you want to make some remarks, if you want to speak of something we haven't debated yet or discussed yet. Then maybe, Michaela, I will still say one sentence for the end, because I think I think it's important if we want to motivate, um, empower people to, to be active in this topic, to, to stand up for, for the rights of migrants, but, but also to, uh, to, to talk about it in the right way. I, I think that it's a, it's a pure psychology that we as humans, we feel empathy and this will of being engaged uh, when we are not afraid and when we see hope for change. So this is what what, what, for example, now with the situation with Ukrainians happening, that there is no fear in helping, in supporting, in organizing meetings, in inviting people home. And Polish government is discussing how to make things better, how to integrate people into the uh, labor system, into schools. Is it better that kids age 18 will, uh, will have Ukrainian teachers or not? There is a perspective, there is future. And when we humans see that things like this are possible and are allowed, then we are much more motivated to, to act toward this direction. So I would try to go also from this perspective that we need to fight for lack of uh, fear in this topic and for pushing things forward and having this longer perspective, because only then we all will, will get more involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your empowering remark. So if there are no questions, I would ask Professor Goyet if you have um, two, a final remark you want to share with me and all those listening. And then I think we can also wrap this up. Sure. Um, so I would agree entirely with Anna. And, you know, I think that, you know, the perspective of sort of edu educating um, speaking on it, but also sort of speaking the truth, right, on these issues, which is what I think we're, tr we're trying to do with this session, all of us, which is to sort of name, um, you know, name things as they're happening, right? Name racism as if any name discrimination as it's happening, name logistical violence as it's happening, um, recognize the violence and brutality that's entailed in the borders that we surround ourselves with, and really question um, the status quo of the world that we exist in, um, you know, and the idea that these are sort of moral markers for countries, countries have a right to protect them, really question this language that we use to normalize and validate, um, you know, day-to-day -day violence. So it's, a, it's you know, 
I, I'm, I really appreciate this session. I really appreciate this this opportunity to to um, address this um, in this group. And um, and thank you all for coming. And thank you so much for having me. Thanks to you. Thanks to both of you really much for uh, having accepted our invitation and having enriched this event with your with your perspective. And really, I'm really glad to have had this opportunity to to speak about this this challenging and wide and tough topic and to remind that the protection of civilians in Ukraine must be a priority, but it has to include all civilians affected at all borders because protecting civilians by uh, intentionally leaving thousands of others in despair, both at land and at sea across the same borders is not a solution, cannot be a European solution. And to address a humanitarian crisis, all humanity involved must be prioritized and seen, made visible and humanized. And I think that opportunities like this webinar are helpful to think and to also maybe act better, vote better, maybe act better uh, within our societies and see more um, the, the migrants uh, within our societies um, or those who are trying to, to, to arrive in, in, uh, and to support them better and to better support also all those actors like Grupa Granica and Ioana or all those um, actors working, working um, on, the, on the field to, to, to protect uh, concretely their human rights. Thank you very much to everybody and to all those who have listened to us. And um, yeah, bye-bye. Thank you so Thank much for organizing you. too.